So uh, the orientation that uh, I like to uh, begin with is the orientation that I really discovered um, fully when I was doing the work on editing um, the Teisho's that became the book Manifesting Zen, which I hope you all have a, a copy of um, either the ebook or the the hardcover, which is beautifully produced. Um, anyway, what that is, is that, uh, well, there's actually two really important things and that really affect the way in which we do Zazen. So it, I consider these to be foundational uh, to the way Joshi Roshi taught uh, and to what Joshi Roshi taught us. So uh, the first is the idea that um, as we experience, as we go through this um, experience of the alternation of complete and incomplete selves, we are we need to remember to always stay, uh, as we do Zazen, uh, to stay grounded in what he called the Jibun no Sumi Basho, the, the uh, dwelling place of the self, the dwelling place of the self. Uh, the space that is created um, as the incomplete self uh, goes through continual transformations of uh, affirmation and negation, of arising and passing away, um, of plus and minus, of uh, positive and negative, of uh, male and female. Rishi used a lot of different uh, uh, metaphors for these two complementary and contradictory forces uh, through which we experience the world and that manifest themselves through us. But if we understand that only as a, a, in an abstract way, then we fail to see how it is really grounded in our moment to moment and our second to second experience as we sit um, uh, on our cushions um, and as you are uh, listening uh, at the moment, and I'm talking at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and so when I teach now, I uh, begin by orienting my students uh, to this uh, dwelling place of the self, uh, which can also be uh, conceived of as a sphere of experience. I think this is what in the Rinzai Roku is meant by the, the sphere of red flesh, not the lump of red flesh, which uh, if you remember that passage, you know, uh, uh, Linji or Rinzai says uh, on that uh, lump of red flesh or that sphere of red flesh, there exists a true person of no fixed position. This true person of no fixed position constantly going in and out of the doors of perception, the doors of your face, your eyes, your ears, your nose, um, this true person. But an early textual variant says, instead of the lump of red flesh or sphere of red flesh, says five skandhas. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, uh, the skandhas are uh, an alternate way of approaching the uh, fully embodied experience of living in the moment. They consist of form of just kind of pure, uncategorized sensation. And as we sit here on the cushions, we can see how really everything, the feeling of our body on the cushions, the air that we breathe, the thoughts and feelings that arise and pass away are all manifestations of this very important second skanda of Vedana. Roshi uh, always had a lot to say about Vedana. Uh, third skanda is Samjna, which means uh, perceptual categorization. So um, perceiving birds chirping or cars going by uh, from just simply in the moment, in, this, uh, in, in terms of sensation, hearing the sound. And then perceptual categorization or uh, feeling discomfort in your foot uh, but not labeling it. Well, the third sk skanda is all about labeling. The fourth skanda is all about the different continuing psychological patterns that we deal with uh, throughout our lives that we're kind of born into it. And that's kind of where I want to uh, focus my attention today with uh, something uh, both uh, 
personal and uh, dharmic. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and the the afiskanda is simply stream of consciousness. It's the it's the feeling that consciousness is continuous, and that really leads to the um, something that's in the the fourth skanda uh, um, of uh, psychic patterns. It leads to the pattern of misapprehending a constantly flowing, constantly changing uh, self, uh, misapprehending that as being uh, fixed, and misapprehending that there's a fixed sense of self-identity that we then use uh, to bring into every moment. The contrast is well enunciated uh, by uh, the famous Zen philosopher of the 20th century, the founder of the Kyoto School, uh, Nishida Kitaro, who said, uh, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote. He says, uh, in the West, you think that because you have a self, you have experiences. But in Zen, what we say is, because there is experience, a self arises. Again, the difference. In the West, you think because you have a self, you have experiences. But in Zen, what we say is, because there is experience, a self arises. Now, the way in which that self arises has been uniquely presented and enunciated by uh, Kyozan Joshi Roshi. And I certainly want to bring um, everything that I've learned, probably imperfectly, from Roshi uh, into uh, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, Going back now to the uh, through the back through the five skandhas, back through the lump or sphere of red flesh, to uh, how I approach uh, teaching about Jibunda Sumibasho, the dwelling place of the self, that it has four dimensions. And Roshi taught three dimensions. He really also taught a fourth dimension. He just didn't label it that way. And so this sphere of experience, this sphere of red flesh, these five skandhas, that each and every one of us right here at this moment, right here right now, is experiencing this sphere has the first dimension, which is the vertical space that the sphere occupies. So in order to get a real sense of that, please direct your attention to the way your body feels on the cushions or in the chair if you're sitting in a chair. And then draw an imaginary line to the top of your head. And as you breathe in and breathe out, really sense this vertical space that your sphere of experience occupies. A good corrective to having a jabbering mind is always go back to how this sensation of being grounded on the cushion and rising up to the top of your head, the vertical plane of our sphere of experience, how that feels. The second is horizontal. It's a horizontal plane. So imagine a plane connecting your knees, toes if you're sitting in a chair. Your knees, your elbows, goes from shoulder to shoulder, from ear to ear. It's the horizontal plane, the horizontal space we occupy, each and every one of us. So we have vertical space, we have horizontal space. And the third one, is depth, depth space, the third dimension. 
and you can sense that if you establish a plane connecting your nose and your tailbone your toes or your knees in the back of your neck and see them feel them intersect really feel that depth that's the third dimension depth and Joshi Roshi really emphasized the importance of doing a fully embodied three-dimensional practice not getting lost in abstraction always embedding our practice within these three dimensions letting go of the constant tendency we have to live the world in in the world in two dimensions the constant tendency we have to objectify our own experience and then of course become attached to the objectification of that experience because of the fourth dimension which Roshi talked about separately but which I like to add in here and that's the fourth dimension is time constantly as we breathe in and breathe out and actually much much more quickly than we can normally perceive time is manifesting through us. And so, when we move from moment to moment, from second to second, not only do we perceive sounds external to us, do we perceive our fully three-dimensional embodied dwelling places which are absolutely unique to us even with twins and I know a few uh, sets of identical twins but they also have these unique dwelling places but the thing is these dwelling places are in a constant change constant flux and we often forget that And so we often crystallize or fixate specific experiences by taking the experience as an object. Oh, that was good. Oh, that was bad. Oh, what was that bird? Every time, I could go on and on and on. Uh, every time that happens, we separate from the experience because the experience has already gone and that experience becomes a mental object before the sense faculty of mind recognized throughout the Buddhist tradition as you know the sixth the sixth sense so within this dwelling place there is this ongoing and constant movement, dynamism, manifestation of something deeper. Now, Roshi didn't like to use terms like that, but I find them very effective in conveying that uh, the way we normally experience the world from the standpoint of a fixed self looking at the world as other capital o other is uh, limited it's the activity of the incomplete self one of the other important uh, ideas uh, that i discovered in doing the work on manifesting zen was the fact that translators and even the best translators, and, and I worked with the work and the, the uh, follow-up, a Q&A that I did for a couple of years with Christopher Ives, who was one of the best translators of Josu Roshi. Um, there are these two terms, Xin and Ju, which uh, Roshi talks about, and they go back to the Rinzai Roku. 
Um, one of them is object and the other is subject. Well, actually, see, I, fall, I just fell into the same, uh, the same problem. It's just such a tendency to do this, and that's what happens in, uh, in modern Japanese. But in fact, the terms are used uh, differently uh, and significantly differently uh, in a way that most translators didn't pick up. And I spent, uh, in the overall process of uh, doing this book, I spent a month uh, double-checking, sending uh, copies of uh, Roshi talking about these uh, two contrasting terms, uh, hin and du, and uh, to uh, eight or nine different uh, scholars and practitioners, uh, translators, all, uh, bilingual, all of them. Um, and what became clear is that uh, while most translators translate them as uh, object and subject or subject and object, that actually in most cases Roshi was using guest and host. Uh, and guest and host come from the Rinzai Roku, uh, as you know. Um, uh, maybe in a subsequent uh, Sundays I can talk about specific passages in which guest and host appear. But you cannot equate, uh, as a lot of modern scholars do as well, you cannot equate host with subject and guest with object because that implies a fundamental differentiation between subject and object, an ontological, uh, foundational differentiation between subject and object, between self and other, between self and world. And that causes us to misapprehend a fundamental teaching that Joshi Roshi was giving us, and that is that the host is this underlying dynamic activity of the Tathagata, of the thus come and thus gone, but that this host when we experience this host, is experienced as the total unification of subject and object. And the guest is the differentiation between subject and object. So that differentiation between subject and object, which since Descartes has become uh, something that has pervaded not just the culture and worldview, it's pervaded the, the psychology of each and every one of us who's grown up uh, thinking that the world, the environment is other and thinking that ourself, ourselves are fixed um, and not constantly flowing and not really in fundamental ways constantly arising and passing away together with uh, the world as we perceive it as other. So it's this sense of profound unification of self and other, of subject and object, that is the foundation. That is the foundation of our moment-to-moment -moment experience. We are one with this uh, larger cosmos in which we live. And we, of course, have neglected that with our peril, as we see on a daily basis. <clears throat> so, sadly, um, when I went back through... Uh, the 35 Teshos in the Manifesting Zen book, I really had to go back and look at every instance uh, where uh, Chris uh, Ives translated subject and object, and in about 80% of the time, Roshi was really talking about guest and host. And about 20% of the time, he was talking about... He never really... He actually... Um, uh, at one place, and one and one Teso actually asks, uh, uh, says, you know, well, in the West you have these terms subject and object. I wonder if they might be appropriate in this context. He said, well, I don't think so, but it's up to my students to figure that out. Um, again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's in the book. Um, so, 
uh, instead of saying subject and object, uh, he might say subjective and objective, you know, which are, you know, they're uh, adjectival and they suggest a, a temporariness that subject and object doesn't. That's the other problem. Uh, when you reify a separation between subject and object, you become attached to the subject. <clears throat> The subject that each and every one of us is. <clears throat> and that tends to uh, reinforce uh, the concept of uh, that we have a fixed self. The incomplete self becomes even more attached. So, you know, what's the way to break this down? What's the way to break through this? Well, obviously it's zazen. And how you do zazen, though, is really, really important. And I, I feel like, um, as a Sangha, we've kind of failed to fully absorb Roshi's teaching here. Because um, uh, so so many of us become stuck and attached to one particular way of looking at things. Um, and, you know, if they didn't, if I, I've heard from so many uh, older Sangha members, you know, my generation, uh, uh, well, you know, you, I didn't hear that from Roshi, so, you know, my point of view is that that's wrong. You know, what you said is wrong. You know, Roshi didn't say that to me. I didn't hear Roshi say that. I heard a lot of his, he didn't say it. So it's this kind of sense of uh, attachment. So once, once you reify a certain set of ideas and take them to be ultimately true and not subject to this constant dynamism, this constant change, this constant expansion and contraction, as Roshi, Joshi Roshi often talked about it. Once you reify these ideas, you also subtly re reify, you affirm the fixated self that holds these to be true. So we live in a flowing world, in a flowing universe, constantly changing, constantly arising and passing away. So how do we put a stake as uh, uh, one uh, Atan master said, you know, you can't put a stake in, maybe even Lindsay said this, you can't put a stake in emptiness, right? You can't stop the flow. It's just going. Constantly manifesting. So the orientation that I like to teach, uh, that I, I, I teach my students uh, is that be grounded in this sphere of experience. And then as you develop a practice, before you get a koan, you develop a practice of breathing. Deeply breathing in, slowly breathing out, perhaps counting on the in-breath and counting on the out-breath. And always returning to your breathing within your sphere of experience is foundational to Zen practice, both Soto and Rinzai. In addition to that, there is this area in our body-mind, in our sphere of experience. By the way, that term is, uh, I use that deliberately. I mean, that Perhaps it was Dogen who first, at least that's the person I remember first, talking about this concept of body-mind. There is no separation between mind and body. That's another problem that we have uh, with Cartesian <coughs> epistemology. <coughs> Since Descartes said, uh, you know, je pense donc je suis, I think, therefore I am. So, <coughs> emphasized thinking, emphasized uh, dualistic uh, thought, the dualistic engagement with the world that is grounded in this, uh, what Zen and, and Buddhism uh, s sees as a f false notion of the existence, kind of, you're as assuming uh, at the very beginning that <clears throat> the self is real and permanent and the world uh, is outside the self. And that thought, the thinking of the self, actually not, not, not your feelings, not your intuitions, 
not uh, your perceptions, uh, not your your bodies, not our bodies. Uh, it's it's the it's thinking that reassures us that we exist, and I think that's been a that's been a problem. Thinking is very important, but it's not all that we do as human beings. But uh, absolutely not. Um, so. <clears throat> <clears throat> really what I wanted to talk about today uh, is, well, a couple of things, really. <clears throat> I found out, um, I, I'm, I'll make this uh, personal and then I'll expand it <clears throat> uh, out from the personal <clears throat> I found out about 10 days ago that, um, you know, my, my dad was an immigrant. He came from uh, one of the Jewish settlements somewhere between uh, Warsaw and Kishinev, which is the capital of Moldova. And now that we're all focused on that region of the world because of what's going on in the Ukraine, um, uh, something um, uh, I learned was incredibly disturbing and I've been processing it in one way or another uh, for the last 10 days um, nobody and you know my dad was the third oldest of uh, nine children and uh, so I knew most of my aunts and uncles uh, throughout uh, a lot of my uh, child childhood and uh, into my adult life and nobody but nobody talked about what life was like in what my dad would call the old country. The only thing my dad talked about was the, the trip uh, that he and his mom and two brothers, uh, my grandma, uh, the only grandparent I knew, took from uh, Warsaw down through Bucharest in Romania and over to uh, Soroki, which is about 70 miles from the capital of Moldova, Kishinev. Uh, but there was a curtain of silence that was dropped over family history and probably only the older children knew anything about it but i just i uh, received the transcript of an interview that one of my cousins i have 22 cousins but, you know there being nine siblings it's that's not surprising um in my dad's sibling set uh and i just uh got the uh, transcript of what, uh, an interview one of my cousins did with the oldest uh, girl in my dad's sibling set, uh, Aunt Rosalie, who was known. She was very tough, so we called her Aunt Butch. Uh, and Aunt, Aunt Butch told uh, my cousin about the fact that my grandmother, at the age of 15, was a witness to the pogrom of 1903 in Kishinev. Pogroms were sudden attacks on Jewish settlements by the locals that sometimes the police participated in, uh, sometimes uh, they tried to do a little bit to stop them, and uh, groups of, of peasants who were non-Jewish uh, would descend upon Jewish settlements and simply attack men, women, and children, rape, kill, uh, burn businesses and villages. But the uh, pogrom of 1903 was particularly a brutal one. And photographs of that pogrom got out uh, to the New York Times. And it was on the front page of the New York Times about a month later. Uh, well, what uh, I found out from reading this transcript is my, my grandmother was one of the victims. Um, at the age of 15, she witnessed her father and brother being forced to dig their own graves and then being murdered in front of her. And this is an horrific event. Uh, so, of course, it's completely understandable that no one wanted to talk about it. Uh, thankfully, you know, and it would have been lost completely from our family record and the, the, the kind of 
personhood of the individuals who who died that day who i guess would have been my uh, let's see my my great uncle and and my great grandfather uh about whom I know nothing. I don't even know for sure what their names were, um, but they were victims. And that sense of peril, that sense of danger, that sense of death being something that could happen at any moment, suddenly, without warning, uh, has been in the background of the way I developed um, as, a, as a child and as an adult, even though none of that was directly communicated to me. None of that. There was a curtain of silence dropped around us. But yet, because of that trauma, because of that uh, horror uh, that was witnessed, Something changed in the way that I received. You know, uh, each one of us, um, when we're born, you know, we don't come out with a completely clean slate. Uh, in many ways, we are we have our genetic inheritance, our DNA that comes from our parents. But there's also something else, uh, and that's part of our karma. Um, but something else that's part of what we inherit is our parents' emotional lives um, in the way in which they interact with us, in the way that in which they raise us, in the way in which they express their own emotions or don't express their own emotions, in a way that they talk about their feelings or don't talk about their feelings. Uh, children are like sponges, as uh, those of you know who've had children, and they absorb absolutely everything. Whether you intend it or not, now, having been a parent, I realize, <laughs> uh, even though I tried to avoid what I thought were the mistakes my parents made with me, yeah, um, and I really consciously tried. Uh, I can see some of those same issues that I had with my parents uh, that I carried into my children. Anyway, this sense of uh, death being always present and uh, always ready to pounce uh, at a moment's notice, at a second's notice, is probably ultimately what led me to Buddhist practice. Uh, I remember uh, uh, when I first started practicing with Roshi on the East Coast, um, there was a session we had at Stony Brook that Les Femi, the late Les Femi, organized was the spring of 73, I think, 1973, at Stony Brook uh, University in Long Island, where Les had uh, been a psychology professor. And to my great surprise, after the session, um, Roshi invited me to come uh, to his quarters, where basically he was having a small party. Um, and uh, uh, knowing I was going there, and uh, having read uh, Nishida um, and the uh, Nishitani, uh, who turned out to be the this famous Kyoto philosopher, Kyoto school philosopher, who was a personal friend of Joshi Roshi's, um, uh, having read something of his, I wrote, I think I wrote this uh, in, um, uh, in Japanese, which I was just learning at the time. And that is that uh, uh, life is constantly hanging above a void of uh, complete nothingness or complete emptiness. And uh, I presented that to him, and he, he gave me this look like, whoa, you know, you, you're reading stuff like this? Um, so what is this that you're experiencing? And, of course, this was the first time I'd seen Roshi since my father had passed away. My dad died at the very early age of 62, very suddenly coming home from work sick on a Wednesday night and dying on a Sunday morning um, from what they said was the pneumonia. Um, so, uh, Rusty uh, basically uh, asked me um, how I was, and I told him that my dad had died. Um, 
And this idea of death being constantly present uh, uh, and the, the trauma, the psychological trauma that I inherited as part of my karma that I got when I was born and that I, as I was raised got communicated to me even though there was never any direct discussion of it uh, became part of my uh, way of looking at the world. And it's really only been in uh, recent uh, years, uh, and especially in uh, because I had the great privilege of uh, working through these tape shows, and you know, continuing practice and seeing uh, my practice uh, in light of what I remembered Roshi having taught me, and uh, in light of my life experiences. I've come to really appreciate Roshi's teaching, which in some ways is also, I mean, it's not just Roshi's, it's a common Zen teaching across many Zen traditions. Uh, and uh, it's, I can express it with, uh, with another story. Um, and that is a very short story. So maybe most of you know who DT Suzuki was, uh, very famous, uh, uh, Zen scholar, um, he was a probably lay ordained. He lived from uh, 1870 to 1965, was very, very important in bringing Zen to the West. Um, and he, um, he was at a, he was at a, a conference, uh, academic conference. I don't know if it was during his days at Columbia or if it was one of the, uh, first East West philosophers conferences in Hawaii, but a bunch of Zen scholars were in the room, uh, yakking about about something and uh, talking about something really obscure and uh, and it looked like uh, Suzuki was sleeping because he had his eyes closed which he often did during these academic meetings and and then they were talking about the issue of life and death and what was the Zen attitude towards life and death and uh, what about karma and what about reincarnation and Suzuki, they thought he was sleeping, but all of a sudden he opened his eyes, he pounded the desk, and he said, living is dying. Everybody was shocked. So I guess the old professor wasn't sleeping after all. <laughs> so what does this mean, living is dying? Uh, and... Um, I've come to appreciate in, uh, in the context of Roshi's teaching, uh, what that means, uh, living is dying. Uh, and in fact, this is something that in the course, uh, that I'm teaching there, one of my courses on, on Taoism, um, I'm teaching came up because of the Taoist attitude of accepting death as a natural transformation. Um, um, but of course, Taoism doesn't teach anything like the the uh, sphere of experience or the complementary uh, and comp uh, contradictory activities of plus and minus, uh, which also Roshi talked about as the activity of life and the activity of death. Uh, literally half the time in our lives, if we didn't, if there wasn't this process of dying completely integrated um, into into our everyday experience, into our moment-to-moment -moment experience, I'd never be able to get to the end of the sentence, and you'd never be able to he hear the end of the sentence. So this constant expansion and contraction, activity of plus, activity of minus, they 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 complement each other. They're constantly present. This is part of um, the thus come and the thus gone. The activity of thus coming uh, is the plus activity, the living activity, the life activity. The activity of thus gone is uh, the uh, activity of, of death. It's the activity of minus, of contraction, expansion as we breathe in. And this, I think expansion and contraction, which Roshi used a lot, um, really helps ground us in our spheres of experience. In, the Jibunna Sumibasho, the dwelling place of the self, which is three 
if not four, I would say four dimensional. Roshi taught time separately uh, for, I don't know, for a variety of reasons, probably. Um, but uh, future and past are constantly shifting as the present is constantly shifting, as time is constantly moving. So the extent to which the activity of dying is just part of our lives uh, is something that we just simply can't appreciate. If we live life from the standpoint, if we think there is this ultimate separation between subject and object, if we think that the host is subject and the guest is object, if we don't appreciate the fact that we have this constantly flowing, constantly changing uh, self, uh, moving from incomplete separation to unification, uh, as we as we breathe in, we expand and we expand and expand, as Roshi explained. But the activity of contraction is always pulling, always pulling, so that we can't expand out infinitely into the universe, uh, at least not while we're alive. Uh, and so the activity of contraction is pulling back, pulling back. And so there's a there's a, an apex that expansion reaches when the force of expansion and the force that's pulling it backwards of contraction reach a moment, a second, a millisecond of equilibrium. In that, in that equilibrium, the complete self is realized. And then the contraction process starts back down again. And But expansion is always pulling in the opposite direction. But yet there's a nadir that's reached, an equ another equilibrium. And that, that's also manifestation of the complete self. There's a complete unity of expansion and contraction. There's a complete unity there of, of subject and object. And then it breaks out. It's, it's a constant, constant dynamism that embraces us from moment to moment that manifests through us, that we manifest. Uh, and of course, our flowing selves are completely interconnected. Uh, we're not these isolated, separate individuals, even if we choose to live our lives as isolated, separated individuals. We're constantly in relationship. That's why I think Roshi put such an emphasis on relationships, um, uh, developing uh, close uh, relationships with another human being gives you an opportunity to get outside yourself, gives you an opportunity to uh, give of yourself, um, gives you an opportunity to express uh, the Mahayana precept of dana, giving. And really, that's, that's something that um, uh, uh, Jiyun uh, Zenji talked about when he gave a talk last week um, about these moments of, of giving, of giving of self, of giving over uh, this kind of secret kindnesses that get done in uh, Zen monasteries, secret kindnesses that we do to one another. It doesn't even have to be s secret. <laughs> it can be... Um, in your relationships with your your closest friends, with your partner, uh, there is, with many of us, a, a kind of natural and spontaneous giving of self, a relinquishing of the position of, you know, it has to be the way I want. It has to be what I want to do, kind of my way or the highway. There is that kind of giving over of self. And the more we do Zen practice, the more we can get a sense of perspective on what we consider to be our uh, self, ourselves, our sense of self-identity. Um, and within that context, you know, coming back to this family trauma, uh, as I'm uh, trying to process it, uh, what I found is that it's really important to let uh, whatever emotions are present, to let them arise and to express them. 
And if it means crying, uh, if it means getting angry, uh, there needs to be a time and a space to do that. Uh, these are naturally arising responses to a horrific situation. And human beings seem to want to always, <laughs> Uh, because I think of attachment to these notions of fixed, self, fixed selves, you know, this kind of extreme narcissism that leads to the kind of uh, dictatorships that we see in many places in the world today. Um, but also, uh, you know, to, to have fixed positions, you know, this is true, that's false. And, and, you know, I hate you for not having the same position as I do. Well, you know, that's a, another form of attachment. So what I found is that uh, with uh, really negative uh, emotional experiences, and, and we never really received any direct teaching from Joshi Roshi about how to deal with emotions. Um, and uh, But that's not surprising because I don't think there's a whole lot in Zen uh, in which, you know, if anything, you know, it would be, especially for men, you know, don't express your, don't cry, as I was told by one of our family friends when I was a little boy of maybe six or seven, you know, don't cry, you look so ugly when you cry. <laughs> Shut down my ability to cry for over a decade. Yeah, more than, yeah, probably a decade and a half. Uh not even at my dad's funeral could I cry. But yeah, I've been working out the sadness um, of that I received from my dad. The sense of the suffering of life, the universal suffering in the world. The sense of his personal suffering. And the sense of sadness at not being able to do enough to make his suffering better. It was kind of un, unquenchable, really. And I think some of that came from the family trauma of his mother, my grandmother. He was born a few years after this happened, uh, witnessing the slaughter of her father and her brother. Um, so, the way that I've been dealing with it is just it, when emotions surface to get them out and not to suppress them and get them out as fully as possible. Uh, give them the light of day, let the energy arise. Uh, knowing, of course, in the context of this constant change, this constant flowing nature of self, that um, all of these, uh, even the worst moments that we have emotionally in our lives, they're temporary. Uh, if we don't allow that uh, energy uh, f that is attached to the emotion, and and that's a really it's it's a really embodied. It's a it's not only the the memory or the thought that's in, in the emotion, but it's also the body, our bodies. You know, it, it's a fully embodied release. Let it out. I wish it was really good at letting. <laughs> His, his, when he got angry, you did not want to be around. Boy, did he, whoa. And you certainly did not want him to be angry at you. But then when it happened, it happened. And it was, boom, like a bolt, like a little mini explosion. And then it was gone. Uh, and I really feel like that's, you know, the example that he gave so I didn't appreciate him being mad at me at the time. And I often didn't appreciate what he was teaching me. Uh, he taught in some strange ways sometimes, especially in Sanzen. But um, I trusted him. Not all the time, but basically most of the time. And because of that, I learned. Uh, so I, I have such deep appreciation for the unique way in which he taught uh, and I find that it very much helps deal with uh, situations that arise in my life. And uh, I hope in a small way that seeing uh, this 
family emotional trauma from my own life and sharing that with you has uh, given you a little bit of insight into perhaps the way that this teaching, which didn't really ever deal with emotion, uh, how this teaching uh, can uh, help us uh, process uh, the emotions that inevitably arise in our lives in full appreciation that as they arise, they're a manifestation of the, act, of the plus activity. But remember also that as they arise, they are also passing away. And it's possible to let them arise and then to let go. And letting go is that activity of death, that activity of dying that we seem to be so afraid of. Um, I was just uh, listening to a uh, uh, Tasha, which I hope to share with the Sangha soon. Uh, it's one of the great Shenzhen Young's translations. And uh, Roshi specifically says in this Tasha, which is from February 1996, um, he says, There's, you know, most people are afraid of death and of dying. He says, But there's, you know, no need to be afraid because when we die, we dissolve into the universe and manifest that whole universe. Um, the only way that we can understand that intellectually, but the only way that we can experience that is, is through deep and continuing a practice uh, of Zazen. And I want to encourage everybody to continue to do that. And I want to thank you all for uh, your patience in uh, joining me uh, this afternoon. Um, I want to urge you to you know, be well, stay safe, and to, uh, to do more Zazen. Thank you.